If you are <coughs> wanting to read along in your own Bible, we are reading this morning from Colossians chapter 1, verse 24 to 29. The Colossians 1, uh, verse 24. Now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been hidden for ages and generations, but it is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which in Christ, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we might present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. It's good to be back. Oh, it's good to see some faces I haven't seen before in a little while. Um, yeah. Uh, all right, cool. So we are going to be looking at Colossians 1. Um, it is a, it's a great chapter to preach. Um, it is uh, one of my favorite verses is in this, uh, the, 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 that this mystery this mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Um, so we're going to be jumping right into that today. Um, so let's pray. Let's pray and just center ourselves on the Lord. Father, we thank you, God, that you, um, that you are glorious, you are high above, and yet you have chosen to dwell within your people. Lord, we pray that You would open our eyes to this amazing mystery and this profound, um, just this profound joy of what it means to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Um, so Lord, open our eyes to that. Lord, it's not something we can understand mentally uh, as such, but it's something that You can reveal to us by Your Holy Spirit. So we pray for Your revelation today. And we pray for your challenge today. We pray to hear your voice today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This is the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. This mystery language, this is kind of the language of the day. This is Paul being very contextual with his Colossian audience. Um, mystery was a big thing for them. So they're, the Gnostics had this hidden knowledge. Um, the Greeks were all about knowledge. Um, the Romans were all about glory. Uh, and so this glory and knowledge and mystery. And, 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 and so there was this longing to know the mystery. And so uh, and there were different parts of um, the, they worship the unknown God. Right, So there was a lot of mystery in the Greek culture. And so what Paul does is he goes, you know what? You know what? You're after this mystery that has been hidden for ages and generations. It's now available. It's now revealed to his people, to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of his glory, of this mystery. This is the mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let that sink in. <laughs> that the mystery of the ages is that Christ lives in you. That the fullness of God, that the Holy Spirit of God, God Himself, has been given as a gift to live in you. This is the mystery. Um. As, as I'm working through this, I want to introduce a concept to you uh, or, or just, to, just to kind of unpack something um, as we go through this. So the gravitational pull for us as people 
and it happens in the church a lot, is that we're pulled, um, the, the gravitational pull of the church is that we're pulled inward. What I mean by that is that often, you know, we're, we're called, uh, we're like the only organization on earth that exists for its non-members, right? And yet, our, our gravitational pull is to go inward, to look at what are we doing for, you know, our programs, right? We get all program-centered and, and it's about what we're doing kind of, and often it's about what we're doing for us, right? So that, that's kind of the pull. The pull is to go inward. It's like, oh, yeah, but let's, let's do this and let's do this. And, and, and so we're focused on relationships within the church. And, and what God is pulling us toward is to look outward and to have our, our, um, to have our, our, our hearts filled with, with God's mission for the world and for people who don't know Him yet. But this pull kind of pulls us this way to, to look inward. And, and, it, and it's important to gather as the church. That's an important piece, right? That, that's breathing in. But this is breathing out, right? And so if you only ever breathe in, you will actually suffocate. <laughs> Because you don't empty your lungs, <laughs> and so and so we need both. But the, but but our tendency then is to do this more than that, right? It's the gravitational pull. It's kind of like when you're you go into the ocean and uh, and and you know our kids love. We've got the little boogie boards and and we ride the waves and stuff, and then we go out and and the current will pull you outside the flags, right? So you got to keep looking and go, oh, oh, the flags, we're over here. We drifted, right? Let's, let's go back this way. And it's like that. It's like the gravitational pull of the church is to kind of go inward. Um, the second thing about this gravitational pull is to go back to a temple model of worship. What I mean by this is in the Old Testament, um, there was... Uh, there was this idea that, well, and, and God set it up, this God lived, God's presence was in the Holy of Holies. And so to meet with God, you had to go to the temple or to the tabernacle before the temple was made. And there was a place where God was where you had to go to meet with God. And, um, and the priest would then go to God on your behalf and give you absolution, right? Forgiveness for your sin. Uh, and... and then you would meet with God in the temple and you would feel close to God because that's where... And you would walk away feeling happy. You'd been to the temple. You'd, you'd feel forgiven. You, you'd remember who God is and the greatness of God. And, and, and that was great. And that was the Old Testament model. And that was, um, that was what people did. And it was the rhythm of going to the temple uh, and then going about your life and then going back to the temple and your life in the temple. But what happened in the New Testament is that when Jesus died on the cross, the veil that separated the Holy of Holies where God's presence was and the people, that veil was torn. Just supernaturally torn when Jesus died. And what that was, was God saying, no longer... Are we going to do this, you come to the temple thing, but now I am going to put my spirit in you. Jesus told his disciples that this would happen. He said, the Holy Spirit is with you, but he will be in you. And so Jesus changed our model of worship from a temple model where we go and meet with God and then, and then we go about our daily lives to a model where the church it, it, that, that we are now the temple. And that, that's what Paul says. He says, did you not know that you, you yourselves are the temple of God? And so this shift is that we're no longer in a temple model way of worship, but our, but our gravitational pull is that we still, we, we go back to that. Right? So even, even after the New Testament church started meeting in homes and they broke away from the temple model, uh, very much. You know, the temple was destroyed in 64 AD. And the church flourished. Why? Because it wasn't temple-centric anymore. It was everybody, everywhere. But then what did we do as humans? We kind of gravitated back to that. We started to build cathedrals. We started to build churches. We, we, we got building-centered again. And then, 
And, and, and if we're not careful, what happens is we get in that current of the churches where you go on Sunday and then you live the rest of your life and then you go back to church on Sunday and you remember forgiveness and grace and you get filled and you feel good. But that's not what Jesus introduced with this New Testament, this new covenant, this new way of living. This new way of living is that God is pulling us out. And we want to kind of go here for some reason because that's what, we, you know, church, we got to go to church to get forgiven or whatever. But no, but God is like, no, 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 no. I'm calling you this way. Because there's people over here who need you. And it's not about going to the temple. It's you are the temple. The third thing that we're gravitationally pulled to in the church that we just need to be aware of. These are all these things we need to be aware of, right? The third thing is comfort. There's more, but I'm just going to focus on these three. Comfort. I know for me, this is, this is one where it's like, oh, I could do this, but I prefer this. This is comfortable over here, right? But God is always calling us to step out in faith. And by nature, it's not comfortable. But we like comfort. We like predictable. We like to go to church, do church, and then live the rest of our life. You see that gravitational pull? It feels good to breathe in, but we have to be breathing out. And God, and, and it's important for us to meet together, to gather, to, to do life together. It's really important. Like, I, I mean, it's good. But God is pulling us. He's pulling us this way. And so, I want to explore a little bit of what it looks like to let God pull you. I want to start with this story. Um, I, I've, I've told bits of this story before, I think, but um, this past week, uh, I, was at a, um, I was at something at, at, at Moreling um, that we're doing with the Vertical Village stuff, and and uh, one of the speakers there, his name is Craig, um, and he was telling his story about him and his wife and, and how God called them. And, and I was really challenged by it, and I thought, oh man, this is, this, you know, when you hear those and you're preparing a sermon, it's like, oh, this is perfect. Um, but Craig and Danny were, were living a pretty comfortable life. Comfortable. They, they called themselves pew sitters, right? They go to church on Sunday. Go about work the rest of the week. Go to church on Sunday. They were, they were doing, they were well and truly over here. Comfortable. Dual income. Didn't have kids yet. Um, everything, you know, pretty comfortable. Safe. Go to church. This is back in the 90s. They had Tony Campolo go to their church and speak. Now, I don't know if you know Tony Campolo, but he's... Um, He's kind of a straight shooter. And he said to them, uh, where are you spending time with the tax collector, the sinner, and the prostitute? Because that's where Jesus spent his time. Where are you spending time with the marginalized? And they were, they were convicted by it. They're like, ooh, I don't know. Hmm. They started to really like get this growing conviction that God was calling them to love people who were not like them, but they didn't really know how to do it. And so one thing that they did is they went to the local police station to see how they could kind of serve the city, how they could help out, how they could find these people and, and, uh, and, and start to build these relationships and, and that kind of thing. And, and the, the police... Uh, people they talked to had a big map on the desk and and it was the ride eastwood kind of command area and they said well if you really want to help if you really want to find the place that needs it it's right here and he pointed to the government housing estate at ivanhoe uh ivanhoe place by macquarie center they said if you want to help go there and so they did they didn't know what they were getting into but they went there and they started to 
kind of just try and get to know people and try, try to build relationship. But what they realized is that they couldn't really build relationship unless they were kind of living there. And so they submitted something to government saying, look, this is, this is what we see. What we see is a house where we, we, could, um, we could have the church be a presence in the community. So we could get our guy who does physio to do physio for people there. We could get, um, you know, our, our mechanic to come and work on people's cars. We could get the people from our church and these people, and, and, and we could get uh, the teachers to come and do some tutoring or, or whatever. Like, we could, we could do this in that, in that neighborhood. And there were about 120 residences in that neighborhood, and, 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 and it was the crime hotspot of the whole Wright Eastwood area. And it was dangerous, and, um, and it was, they had drugs and gangs and all kinds of stuff there. And, and basically, uh, over time, the government moved them into one of the houses, number 47, Ivanhoe Place. And so they moved in. They quit their jobs. They actually sold what they had and gave it to a missionary in Africa who was uh, connected with their church. They sold what they had and they moved in because they knew that in order to make these authentic relationships happen, they needed to live there. When I was hearing his story, I was like, man, this is, this is what it looks like for us when we hear God calling us to something that's just not this anymore, but it's that. You know, I was pondering this, and I, I really think back to when we did our mission trips at Gerildry, which we're going to try and do next year, God willing. We've had a few years off. But when we went to Gerildry, we did, um, that was giving our high schoolers a similar experience, right? Because it was going to a place where they didn't know, uh, it was not, the church building. It was not inward anymore because it was an outreach. It was running camp for somebody else. So our focus was outward. We weren't in church. And it was definitely not comfortable. And, and then what, and what we did, I mean, we, just spending time with these kids, we only spent a week at a time. But because we went year on year, we started to build relationships because we spent the whole week, you know, went camp. Camp has a tendency of building relationships anyway. But, but these kids, they grew in their faith and their walk in God, and they started to get it, that God's calling us this way, not this way. He's calling us out. He's calling us to make a difference. And, and I love that because I love seeing that light bulb go off, right? And when you read this passage, it, Paul says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Why? Because they're getting it. They're getting this. That this is what God is calling us to. The temple is now out there. And that we're not calling people into the temple. We're actually bringing the presence of God there. And it was because our focus was on these kids. Right? We went to serve them. It was an outward focus. Now, you can't see this photo really well, but this kid's name is Jonathan. And Jonathan was the only Asian kid in town. And so when we showed up, Jonathan found his people. <laughs> Jonathan, like all the other kids, they, you know, it was a day camp. But Jonathan, he slept in tents with our kids because we were his people. Jonathan, like, it was amazing to see how he just connected. And um, it, was, it was really cool because year on year, we would go back. And we saw Jonathan grow up, and every time you go, he's a year older. You know how that, <laughs> that works with kids, right? Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. But one of, the, the, one of the times we went, I had the opportunity to baptize Jonathan in the lake. It was awesome because we went and it sparked something in him that the people that, um, that Kel and Jackie, the, the people who live there, they were able to take on that discipleship kind of piece with him. 
and take it forward. And, and, and they had a really key discipleship piece with him. But, but it was because the, he met God. But he didn't meet God by going to church. Right? He met God because the church came to him. That's what, that's what this, this thing is. It's God going, no, the church needs to meet people. And you know what? There, there's a lot of research, and I don't know if you guys, you probably don't read the articles I do, but there's this, all of this talk right now about the attractional model of church being the old way, right? The, attracting people to come to your church, having good enough program that people want to go to your church. And, 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 and it's like the new way is this, you know, this going out model. And it's like, actually, that's the old, old, old way, right? That's the New Testament way. Where Christ in you meets people where they are and spends time building genuine relationship. And you see people meet Jesus and they discover. And, and not only do they discover, but they discover that Christ in you is the hope of glory. Because I, I, I can give you, I can tell it to you and I can give you like words for it but unless you experience this it will all be theory theory is comfortable oh i can agree to that i believe in that that's great i mean you need to believe you need to agree but you need to step out right and follow where god's calling you because that's where the life is so craig and danny move in right and it's not so easy it's hard. It's hard to break through. They're doing these prayer walks. They're doing. Um, they're just trying to connect with people, and it takes a little while. But after a couple of years, <laughs> you hear that? After a couple of years, they really started to build these relationships, and they were known in the community as a place to go for help. If your kids are falling behind in school, God, oh, Danny can teach. She does this thing. They had their garage all set up like a classroom, and they had everything in it that you would need in a classroom, and they would teach these kids after school because the kids weren't getting all that they needed at home or at school, and they needed somebody to spend time with them to help them along. So they had a little classroom in their garage. They had, like, they had their physio person who, who came along as well and helped out on a regular basis. And they were building these authentic relationships with people. Not They weren't blowing in and blowing out. They were living there, building these relationships. And over the years, the crime rate started to drop. It started to become a more safe place to be. Um, and word got out. This, this community is different. It's changed. What's going on? What's different about it? And people would point them to Craig and to Danny. And um, he loves to tell this story about um, there was a professor of non-theistic philosophy from Macquarie Uni, which is next door to uh, Ivanhoe. And, um, and this professor came to visit and to meet him. And he said, I'm curious as to what's happening here because something's going, like I've heard these different things that this place is transformed, different, he said, tell me what's going on. He said, all right, well, see that guy up there on his balcony? That's Marty. When we moved in, Marty was in his underpants, yelling at people, very angry, off his meds, schizophrenic. And now, Marty's the welcomer at church. He loves people. He's safe. He's on his meds. He's had, a, he's had an encounter with Jesus. Oh, Okay. <laughs> See this lady over here? And he said it was crazy because while he was talking to him, everybody he saw was somebody who he knew had had an encounter with Jesus. And so he's like, yeah, see the lady walking the dog over there? This is her story. She had an encounter with Jesus. Oh, and this lady over here, right? Her kids, this is their story. They came here. This is what happened. They had an encounter with Jesus. 
And this person, this professor of non-theistic philosophy is going, oh, interesting. He's drawn into this because it's real. (laughs) Because this is really happening. Because the church moved in. They didn't just invite people to church. The church moved in. And the... And then uh, the way Craig tells the story, he says, and then the Holy Spirit just said, ask him if he wants to experience the Holy Spirit. So he goes, okay. Would you like to encounter the Holy Spirit in the same way? Yeah, I would. So he prays for him, lays hands on him, and the guy has this experience of God in his living room, just has this experience, this encounter with God. It happens over here, right? It happens when they just took that step of faith and it wasn't easy and they sacrificed for it. It was hard. But it was worth it. You know, somebody could look back on that and go, oh, you know what? It cost them. You know, they, they could be at a better place. They could have more stuff. They could have a better house. Whatever. They, like, you could have better, but, but they will laugh at you. <laughs> Because they'll be like, yeah, but I have something that you can't, you can't buy. You can't, like, the world offers what they think is this, and it's comfortable, and it's, and it, but it's, it will not satisfy you. And what they have is something greater that, that unfortunately, a lot of Christians don't get. And I say that because it is available to all of us. And it happens when we follow God over here. When we follow Him over here. Now, now it's it's diff- This is this is going to be different for everybody, right? And um, it's hard when when I give that kind of a radical example, but I'm really encouraged by their story. So I'm like, man, that's it. That's it. Because that's 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 just leaning into that tension and knowing that tension's real and going, no, I'm going to choose this, right? Um, but it could look different for anybody. But what I want to encourage you is that, you know, Tony Campolo put the question out there, but it was God who spoke. It was God who led them in that direction. And so I don't want to just kind of encourage you. I want to encourage you to start listening for where God might lead you next. What God might be leading you toward. And it could be once a year for a week, like the Gerildery example. Right? It could be a short-term mission trip. It could be, uh, you know, like with foster care, uh, one of the ways that you can help out with foster care is just to be a respite carer, which means one weekend a month where you take care of a child who's in care uh, and you give the foster carers a break. So you give one weekend a month to invest into this child um, and that helps immensely within the whole system of foster care. So it's one weekend a month. You could, be, you could do that if that's what God's calling you to. It could be a number of things. It could be just reading the Bible with somebody at your work who who might be interested in faith, but they don't know where to go. And they're not ready to come to church, but they might be ready to read the Bible. Yeah? I don't know what God's calling you to, but I want to encourage you that the life is found on this side. That that abundant life that Jesus calls us to is over here. And that making disciples is really, it, it, I mean, it really is about just building those authentic relationships the way that God leads you to do it. So I want to give you, um, so I want to relook at this passage, kind of in that context, to relook at these verses. And I want you to be asking God, what does this look like for me? So this is what Paul is saying. After Paul, this is important context though. This is right after Paul has been lifting up Jesus, right? So this whole thing about Jesus being the image of the invisible God and like Jesus being high above, nothing is made but by Him and through Him and 
Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And then Paul says this. He says, now I rejoice in suffering for your sake. And in my flesh, I'm filling up what's lacking in Christ's afflictions. Normally, like, it, that doesn't mean that like Jesus didn't pay it all. It does mean he paid it all, but that there is a next step to this journey. Right? So some translations will say, now I'm, I'm filling up what's next in Christ's afflictions, or that kind of idea, right? So I am following in Jesus' footsteps, right? So Jesus went to the cross for the joy set before him so that you could be forgiven, right? And now Paul is saying, I am gonna, I'm filling up that next step. I'm walking in Jesus' footprints. I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church of which I've become a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the Word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations is now revealed to His saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles. That's, that's, that's an amazing clause, among the Gentiles. Because before it was just the Jewish people, right? But now it's this oh great it's uh, among the gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery christ in you the hope of glory him we proclaim warning everyone teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may, we may present everyone mature in christ you don't get mature over here you get mature over there right and for this i toil struggling with all His energy that He powerfully works within me. This is why I toil, right? That's what Paul says. And that's, you know what? I, I so get that. Because if you see people getting it, if you see the light bulb going on, if you see, like, like I used to love when, when we would do, um, you know, like the last day of camp or the last day of like outreach or mission trip or whatever, where people share what God taught them. I love that. That's like my favorite point, my favorite part. Because you just hear, this light bulb went off for me. I got it. Whoa, this was crazy. I got it. And I love that moment, right? That's, he's like, this is why I toil, struggling with all the energy that Christ has given me and he powerfully works through me because I want that moment when people get it. And so I want to encourage you. This is, your, this is your soul training this week. Two things. One, you meditate on this verse and personalize it, right? So you're saying, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Say it over and over. Just Christ in me, the hope of glory. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Like that sounds so weird sometimes because it's like, oh, but I'm not Christ. But here's the mystery. The great mystery is that Christ in you is the hope of glory. And so I want you to meditate on that. Let that sink in. The more it sinks in, the more that God will start leading you this way. Right? He'll start going, oh, I want you to have this conversation. I want you to step out in faith in this way. Because the more that you get that, Christ in you is the hope of glory. And then the second thing is I want you to listen, trust, obey. All right? So listen for what God might be leading you to. How does He want you to go from comfort to uncomfortable? How does God want you to go from, from a temple model worship to a bringing Jesus to the world model of life? Right? How does, um, how does God want to challenge that inward to change it to go outward? How does God want to do that in your life? Listen, trust, obey. Um, because we can defy gravity. We can swim against that current. But we need to be aware of that and, and intentional about going that way. This series that we're in now is, is on making new disciples through authentic relationships. Right? So we want to encourage you to, um, to look for those relationships that God is calling you to um, to invest in, right? to put more time into? What are those relationships that maybe uh, that have been kind of dormant or latent for a little while, but that God wants you to pour some more energy into? Who are those people who need to, who need, you, you maybe you just need to catch up. 
You just go, hey, we haven't talked in a while. How are you going? Right? So who is that person that God's putting on your mind? Because, because I'm not asking you to bring them to church. I'm asking you to go bring the church to them. Right? We need this, but we also need that. Yeah? So let me pray for you for that. Father, we pray, God, that you would show us the steps that you want us to take to be ministers of reconciliation, to be people who bring Jesus to the world, to be, um, to be your vessels, God. As we sang earlier, just how do, how do we be your vessels? And Lord, I trust that you are going to bring words of challenge to us, God. I trust that you are going to speak. And Lord, you're going to show us those relationships that maybe have already started, but you want us to give more attention to. Or people that maybe we've kind of given up on, but Lord, you're calling us to not give up on them. Lord, we pray for prophetic words for them. We pray that you would put, um, yeah, that your spirit would, would, would move in us on their behalf, Lord, that we would, as Paul said, Lord, we'd be willing to suffer for that. Lord, we'd be willing to put ourselves out there. We'd be willing to, um, yeah, to suffer in some way, to see those people come to maturity in Christ. Yes, Lord. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would take us in that direction, Lord. Help us to defy that gravitational pull and to step out and to be your salt and light in the world. Come, Holy Spirit, speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, let's stand.